and uh, I was having a tough time. I told the Lord, what's wrong? Anyway, I was out in the car, and I was having my radio on, and heard this preacher addressing the situation of Samson. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit began to speak to me and say, that's what I want you to talk about, but not like him. Amen. <laughs> Have you ever heard a positive sermon about Samson? Hmm. Have you ever? Most of them are negative sermons. Yes. Most of them are how he screwed up. Yep. And what a tragedy his life was. Yes. But I want to show you something completely different this morning. Because I don't feel his life was a tragedy at all. Because sometimes when we fulfill the will of God for us, other people looking at us will say, what a waste. Yep, so true. Why'd you spend your time like that? <coughs> Whatever. Now, never forget when this lawyer that I was working for, when I told him I was going to school to be a minister, he was a Catholic and thought I was going to become a Catholic priest or something, and immediately told me that that would be a horrible waste. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Now I want you to open your Bibles to Judges. If you're going to follow Samson's life, you have to read 13, 14, 15, and 16. And then you have to read Hebrews 11. Now, the 11th chapter of Hebrews is the book of faith. It's all these men who lived by faith and accomplished great things. And I want you to understand something. If Samson were a loser, his name would not be in that chapter. Amen. But his name is in that chapter on verse 30, in verse 32, which immediately says, anybody who makes the hall of faith is not a loser. Okay, you got the 13th chapter? All right. I'm reading from the NIV, but I don't know what you're reading from. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, so the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. Now, I want you to get this. How did they get into the hands of the Philistines? Hmm. The Lord put them there. Yeah, that's right. But he had a time limit. 40 years. You follow me? Yes. I want you to keep that in mind. A certain man of Zorah named Manoah, <clears throat> from the clan of Dan had a wife who was sterile and remained childless. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, you are sterile and childless, but you're going to conceive and bear a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink and that you do not any, eat anything unclean because you will conceive and give birth to a son. No razor may be used on his head because the boy is to be a Nazarite set apart to God from birth, and he will begin, notice this, he will begin the deliverance of Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Amen. Now, yes. I want you to get that. That means the 40 years that God said in the first verse is coming to an end. And... The baby boy that's going to be born is going to start their deliverance. Now, I want you to understand, their deliverance doesn't come to an end until King David is on the throne. So you've got the time from, <clears throat> from Samson to David. Okay? Now, pardon me. Then the woman went to her husband and told him, a man of God came to me. He looked like an angel of God. Very awesome. I didn't ask him where he came from, and he didn't tell me his name. But he said to me, you will conceive and give birth to a son. Now then, drink no wine or other fermented drink. Do not eat anything unclean, because the boy will be a Nazarite of God from birth until the day of his death. Now, I want you to get this. He will be a Nazarite from the day of his birth until the day of his death. And you know what, what a Nazarite means? It means somebody that was chosen by God. Amen. Chosen by God. So he is chosen by God before he was born. 
and he will be chosen of God until he dies. <clears throat> then Manoah prayed to the Lord, O Lord, I beg you, let the man of God you sent to us come again to teach us how to bring up the boy who is to be born. God heard Manoah, and the angel of God came again to the woman while she was out in the field, but her husband Manoah was not with her. The woman hurried to tell her husband, he's here, the man who appeared to me the other day. And Noah got up and followed his wife. When they came to the man, he said, are you the one who talked to my wife? I am, he said. So Manoah asked him, when your words are fulfilled, what is to be the rule for the boy's life and work? The angel of the Lord answered, your wife must do all the things that I have told her. She must not eat anything that comes from the grapevine nor drink any wine or other fermented drink, or eat anything unclean. She must do everything I have commanded her. And Noah said to the angel of the Lord, We would like to, you to stay until we prepare a young goat for you. The angel of the Lord replied, Even though you detain me, I will not eat any, eat any of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, offer it to the Lord. Manoah did not <clears throat> realize that it was the angel of the Lord. Then Manoah prepared, and I love this part, the Lord inquired of the angel, what is your name, so that we may honor you when your word comes true? He replied, why do you ask my name? It's beyond understanding. Hmm. Now what he was trying to communicate was, I'm only a messenger, it's not my name that you have to honor. Hallelujah. Okay? I'm just carrying out the message. It's like, don't kill the messenger. <laughs> anyway, pardon me. Uh, then Manoah took a young goat together with the grain offering and sacrificed it on the rock. And I love this, to the Lord. And the Lord <clears throat> did an amazing thing while Manoah and his wife watched. As the flame blazed up from the altar towards heaven, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame. I love the next part. The guy says, we're doomed, we're going to die now. We saw God. And I love the way his wife answers him and says, he wouldn't give us those instructions and tell us that we're going to have a boy if we're going to die. Okay. <laughs> What's your faith? So get past the dying part. Let's get to the living part. Amen. All right. By the time you get to chapter 14, this starts Samson's conquest, God's conquest. <clears throat> Of the, of, of the Philistines, all right? And how does he start it? He starts it by Samson going down there and seeing a young lady he wants to marry. He says, comes home and says to his father, I want you to go make arrangements for me to marry that girl. And of course, his mother and father say to him, you mean there's nobody in your tribe <coughs> worth, that I'm, I'm interested in her. Now, I want you to get, get this picture because you have to understand his purpose. Why was he born? He was born to deliver Israel from the Philistines. Yes. To start the process of deliverance. So everything he is doing is a part of that start-up program. So do you think God had him fall in love with this girl? Why not? Somewhere he had to find a way into the Philistine camp where he could begin to kill them. All right? I mean, if he always stayed up in his tribal camp and never went down there, he would never be able to kill them. So God uses him by starting him with this marriage, okay? <clears throat> Samson went down to Timnah and saw there a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman. His father and mother replied, isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives and so on? But Samson said to his father, get her for me. She's the right one for me. His parents did not know that this was from the Lord who was seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines. Hmm. Do you understand why he fell in love? Yes, indeed. This was of the Lord. That's right. Because His plan. Had, there had to be a start. There had to be a way to start something. Are you, are you following now? Because Amen. almost every sermon I've ever heard on Samson was how he was a, how he screwed up badly. Well, what he did there was the will of God. He found an inroad into the camp of the Philistines. Uh, uh, 
it, 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 in my notes, I say he has his God given mission is to deliver Israel from the Philistines. Nowhere does he tell it, nowhere does he it tell how this was to be done. But to begin, the, the spirit begins here at cha- the end of chapter 13 and beginning of channel, chapter 14. A- and <clears throat> And I love what goes on here because I love the way he take, kills a lion with his hands. <laughs> <laughs> Tears it apart with his hands. <laughs> I've seen a lot of lions in Africa. I am not going to go near one. No, <laughs> barehanded. <laughs> <laughs> Call me chicken. My name is not Samson. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but anyway, <clears throat> the story goes on, Okay. Sometime later, when he went back to marry her, he turned aside to, to look over. Let me, excuse me, let's go back to verse uh, 5. Samson went down to Timna together with his father and mother as they approached the vineyards. Suddenly, a young lion came roaring toward him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power, so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have done a young goat. But he told neither his father nor his mother what he had done. Uh, all right? That's right. You just kill a lion. You tear it all apart with your hands. Yeah, you don't tell anybody? That, you know about <laughs> it's the will of the Lord. Anyway. <clears throat> Sometime later, when he went back to marry her, he turned aside to look at the lion's carcass. It, in it was a swarm of bees and some honey which he scooped out with his hands and ate as he went along. When he joined his parents, he gave them some, and they they too ate. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey from the lion's carcass. Now the father went down to see the woman, and Samson made a feast there, as was customary for the bridegroom. When he appeared, he was given 30 companions. Let me tell you a riddle, Samson said to them. If you can give me the answer within the seven days, of the feast, I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. If you can't tell me the answer, you must give me 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. Let us tell us your riddle, they said. Out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. Hmm. Okay? For, but for, <clears throat> for three days, they could not get the answer. On the fourth day, when they said to Samson's wife, Coax your husband into explaining the riddle for us, or we will burn you and your father's house whole to death. Wow. Did you invite us here to be to rob us? Now, I want you to understand, God is setting up the scene for Samson to begin killing. You understand me? Yes. All right? So, you know that he, he finally tells his wife and, and finally ends up telling them the riddle, and that's the end of it. She... Like he says, if you hadn't plowed with my heifer, you would never have gotten the answer. Hmm. But what I'm getting at is, then he has to go and kill 30 Philistines, take their clothing, and bring it to these men. And you see, don't, 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 don't think light of this. I want you to understand, this is the first step in his killing. Now, he is appointed of God to be a killer. So was David. He was King David was appointed by God to be a killer. Read his life story. What do you read about it? Yes. You read about all the people he killed, all the villages he conquered, all the tent land he brought back to Israel that had been taken. And you have to understand when when God chooses people for a specific thing, that thing is going to be fulfilled in their lives, even though it yep. may not make sense to the rest of the world when they look at it. Yep. Okay. Because a lot of you, even you, you've got relatives that probably think you're crazy. <laughs> or or, or, or why, are you, why do you go to church? Or why do you speak in tongues? And why do you act like that? Yep. Okay? What, what I'm getting at is here, I want you to understand is, God appointed him with the purpose of killing Philistines. And so now comes his first opportunity to do it. And I like the fact that he is so cocky bold, he goes down... And he has no problem with his own hands killing 30 men, taking their clothes off, and bringing them to these guys. Hmm. 
But this, this is just the beginning of this, okay? Because you have to understand, you know, he comes back to, he goes away and he comes back to take his bride and his, her father tells him that he's already given her to another guy to be married and so on. And, and he goes out, and I love this, he catches 300 fox. Hmm. Have you ever tried to catch a fox? <laughs> Let me tell you something. They're worse than trying to catch the the squirrels that run around my neighborhood. They don't play games. You try after them, they're gone. But he catches 300 of them, ties their tails together. Now, I want you to think about this, okay? He's got 300, he's tying together their tails. And he puts a torch between their tails, and he sets them free to run into the vineyards and into the fields of grain of the Philistines. Now, you have to get the picture because God is at work here. I mean, how can one man catch 300 fox, hmm. hold them together long enough to tie their tails together, okay. make torches for 150 of them, set them on fire, and set them free? Now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't get that far. <laughs> <laughs> Get the fox. What I'm getting at is, when God has a divine purpose, it God will, be will done. do everything to enable that divine purpose. Amen. That's it. All right? His purpose was the, was the capture of the, the, the Philistines and the delivering the nation of Israel from the bondage of the Philistines. All right, so, all these fields burn up. All these vineyards are burned up. The owners get angry. Well... That's not a nice town for him to go back to. Yes. So he goes to another town where he meets Delilah. Hmm. In chapter 16, Samson went to Gaza where he saw a prostitute. He went to spend the night with her. Oh, I love this story. He goes to spend the night with this prostitute and people in uptown think that he's going to spend the whole night there. So they're waiting for the morning for him to come out. But instead, he comes out at midnight. What he does is he tears the gates of the city and the posts that hold them, and he carries them 40 miles, and he puts them down. <laughs> now, now, I want you to get this, okay? This, this, this is not game playing. I want you to understand there is divine purpose in all that he's doing. Amen. Now, I'm not saying divine purpose was for him to go with the prostitute. Don't, don't get me wrong. What I'm talking about is the purpose that he's doing, the tearing down of the gate post and pulling him away and sticking him 40 miles away up in the mountains. Now, you're talking about God having chosen man to deliver his people. Now, God did not endorse prostitution and, and sex outside of marriage, and he did not, I'm sure, was not happy with Samson doing that. But, but, Samson was a man chosen by God to a specific purpose. <laughs> now, I, I love this. They're, they're trying to figure out why Samson is so strong. And he lies to them. Mm-hmm. That's what he does, doesn't he? Yeah. He tells him, tie me with this kind of rope or true this or whatever. And, and every time he does that, say, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't even say it now. <laughs> anyway. Every time Delilah. He, he, she asks, he tells her a lie. She tries it. And I don't understand this. Yes. If, these, if these men are hiding in her house... And she screams, how come he doesn't wake up? Hmm. You know, but he wakes up in time to break the bondage and to, for the men to see that he got his hands free and they take off running. Hmm. Because they've already seen what he can do, heard what he can do, and they don't want it happening to them. Right? Now, when he finally tells her that his strength is in his hair, this to me is the greatest part of the story. When he starts, when he tells her finally that my strength is in my hair because I'm a Nazarite, my hair has never been cut from the time of my birth. 
Now, she must have given him some kind of sleeping pill because he sleeps while the barber comes in and shaves his head. Now, I can't imagine sleeping through somebody shaving my head. You okay? Especially if you haven't cut your hair since you were yeah. born. And he now is an adult man. He must have had a, a lot of dregs hanging there. But while he sleep, they cut his hair. But I, I want you to understand something now. The most important part of the story mm -hmm. comes right now. They arrest him. They poke out his eyes. They're making fun of him. But what they're not noticing is his hair starting to grow. And the writer is very clear to tell us that his hair starts to grow. And he realizes his hair is growing, which means my strength must be coming back. And he asks the boy who's guiding him, because he's blind, where can I, help me stand between these two main pillars of this place. Now the Bible tells us that on the roof there were more than 3,000 people up there looking down. And most commentaries estimate that somewhere between two to 5,000 people were in the main facility, so that there were somewhere around 8,000 8, people in that building at that time. All right. Now they're making fun of, of Samson. They feel that they've sapped his strength, he can do nothing. And all of a sudden, Samson prays a prayer. He says, God, let me do it one more time. One more time. And the writer tells us, because his hair began to grow, he put his arms around those two pillars, pulled on those stone pillars, and the whole building comes crashing down. And the scripture says that in his death, he killed more than in his lifetime. Now, what that says is, divine purpose is accomplished. Now, I'm sure that is not what God wanted, would have wanted for, for him to, to, to die that way. But God was not going to let him die without completing his purpose. Amen. You follow me? Yes. When God has purpose for a person's life, he's going to see to it that they live it out. Now, you can follow that all the way through as you go through scripture. You'll find it. Look at the Apostle Paul, divine purpose. From the time he was a boy, he was trained to be a Pharisee. His father sent him to school to Jerusalem at the age of 12, and he stayed there until he was 30, where he became a Pharisee. And he went out to do the work of a Pharisee by killing Christians. And God says, no, you're killing the wrong people. And on the road to Damascus, he stops him and changes his whole life. But the purpose was started, and that boy was trained to become the writer of all the books of the New Testament that he wrote for us. Amen. It was because of the training he had. And I want you to understand this morning that God has divine purpose for every one of you in this room. And that purpose he will fulfill in your lifetime. Even if you struggle with it like, like Samson did and played the games that Samson did, God still had divine purpose, and his purpose for Samuel was, or for Samson was not fulfilled until he died when that building came down and 8,000 Philistines died. That was divine purpose. Because the Philistines were harassing the Israelites and had them in bondage. God is saying, I have purpose for your life, and I'm not through with you until I'm through with you. Amen. Amen. Now, the tragedy is that people quit. Yes. They, 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 they stop doing the things that God called them to do, and they stop doing the things that he has purposed in their lives for them to do, whether it's teaching a Sunday school class, singing on a part of the worship team, being a deacon or an elder of the church, whatever. And they get the idea that this is a man thing, and that's just why I'm doing it. No, it's a God thing. Esther is still playing the piano, still singing worship songs, because from the time she was born, that's what her family, especially her mother, took her to, and she started there. And before her feet could touch the floor sitting on the bench, she started playing the piano. Hmm. You know, it, 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 there, when, when you realize that there is divine purpose for you, that God has, and he has it for every one of us. Yes. There is divine purpose for you. Yes. Yes. And when you feel like nothing is happening, ask him to cause your hair to grow. 
Hmm. That's what that's what Samson did, and his hair began to grow. Now I can't imagine that there was much more than a little fuzz or a little bit of of a beard type of texture on his head, but it was enough. It was enough. And if you quit before God's time for you to quit, you'll live the life of a failure all the, for the rest of eternity. What God is saying to you, I have divine purpose for your life. And all the things you've gone through, the obstacles, the hindrances, all the things that the devil has planned for you, that he's tried to use against you, all right? God still has purpose for your life. Um, Kevin gave me a book to read. And I took it home yesterday and was sitting on the patio and reading. And it took me back to our time in Lebanon because the story is about a Lebanese girl and the horror of the war of Lebanon. And as I read it, it so many things came back because I had been to her village. The lady that worked for me, was, her family was from that village. Her father was a par member of parliament in the, from that village. And one, one night when I needed somebody to save my life, he was there at the courthouse to save my life. And I got back and I was <clears throat> reliving some of these things that went on. You have to understand, if you look back over your life, you'll see times when the devil purposely tried to stop you, destroy you, because God has divine purpose for your life. Yes. And God is going to carry out that purpose. He'll carry it out. He'll cause your hair to grow, whatever the circumstances are. Whatever the devil makes you think that you're through and, and he, he's defeated you, that's the time for your hair to start to grow. Amen. That's when you get a hold of it and say, God, let my hair grow now because I need you now. Yes. I want to destroy the enemy now that's about to defeat me. Yes. You are my strength and my refuge. You are my strong tower. Yes. And whatever it takes, that's what it takes. But that's what I want from you. Hallelujah. You know, it, it's... It's so important that Samson's greatest victory took place in a pagan temple. Hmm. Get that. Inside a pagan temple. Hmm. That's where he was when he killed 8,000 people. His greatest victory in the most unlikely place. Amen. But you see, if God didn't get him inside there, he could never have done that. That's right. And so God had to get him inside that building so that he could pull that temple down and those people be killed. It's so important for you to understand, don't ask questions as to why God does things or how God does things. God's going to do what God wants to do. And our purpose is to submit to his lordship and say, God, thy kingdom come, thy will, will be, be done, done here in my life. Hallelujah. And you let him take charge of your life because he's got things that he'll have you do that you never dreamed you'd ever do. But he's got a plan. From the time before you were born, when you were that embryo in your mother's womb, he already had a plan for your life, and he wanted you to live it out. You see, it's, it's so important that we understand that your greatest victories are not behind you. They're in front of you. And God wants you to be the victor over every one of those situations. And you may have to say, God, let my hair grow. And there has to be some way, forget that special anointing from God, that dynamic of inspiration or whatever it is, to come at that moment where you win the victory. But you can't quit. And you don't give the devil the victory. I love the fact that Samson's greatest victory took place in a pagan temple. They thought they won when they mm -hmm. poked out his eyes. They thought they had won when they abused him and did so, whatever. But all of a sudden, they lost. Because God's purpose was carried out. Now, I, I'm not telling you that the plans of this were, were, were the kinds of things I would choose. But that's beside the point. That's not the point. 
God has plans and purposes for your life, and the devil's going to try all kinds of things to stop you from accomplishing the purpose for which you were born. Whatever he can take, whatever he can do, he's going to try to do it. Because he doesn't want you to be victorious. He wants you to be a loser. But God doesn't have any losers. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I mean, if you want to call it losers, Jesus was the greatest loser of all. Except he wasn't a loser. He fulfilled the divine purpose of his coming to earth. That's right. Every bit of and it. What the scripture is trying to tell us is God has divine purpose for us. And God wants to fulfill that divine purpose. And we have to submit to his lordship. Amen. And that's what has to stay in front of our face is his lordship. Now, I'm sure Samson's mother and father were not pleased with Samson's lifestyle. Hmm. Well, that's very obvious. They, they said, why in the world did you fall in love with a, a Philistine? Can't you find anybody at home? Right. But you see, when, when God has a door that has to be opened, he finds a way to open the door. Amen. Amen. He finds a way to open the door. I was thinking back over some of these things, and I just thinking back. How many times when I thought doors were closed and I didn't know how to get through and God sent the right, right person into my life, but the most unlikely person. Yep. Please expect it. I've told you this before, but when we were in Lebanon, we were wanting to start our campus ministry and I met with the, camp the other campus leaders and I just walked out of the meeting and said, God, I, I, can't, I'm not gonna do, I can't work with these guys. And I get a phone call from a man that I've never met. And he says to me, Bill, you and I have something to like, let's work together. And I'm saying to myself, oh my God, what do we got to like besides you being an American and me being American and you being a man and me being a man? Outside of that, what have we got to like? He was, was notorious. He, he pastored the church he had the international church there, and he never used his Bible. He never, he didn't know anything about that. Anyway, he said, Bill, those campus preachers, they don't like me because I'm liberal, and they don't like you because you're Pentecostal, so let's team up. <laughs> <laughs> but I want you to know that man unlocked the door to every campus. And those other guys were telling me how they couldn't get on the campuses. This man unlocks the door to every campus. He opened up every single door. And then one night when he was at our house for dinner, he accepted Jesus as his savior. And he went back to his church and stood there in his church and apologized to them for having never used the Bible and never read the scriptures to them. And then sometime later, he's back at our house and he gets filled with the Holy Spirit. And he decides then he needs to go back to the church in Tehran that he pastored because he was the same way there. And he flew there to apologize to them and tell them that they needed to know Jesus. What, what I'm getting at is, God can, he can take some of the most unlikely people, put them into your life, and open a door like you've never had. Amen. 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 Because God can do anything. Yes. yes. Don't ever put limits on what God can do. Oh, no. Don't ever tell him he can't do something. <laughs> you, you tell God he can't, and God doesn't even know what the word can't is. <laughs> but uh, but mm. the problem is the devil lies to us, and we develop can'ts. Yes. I can't do that. I can't go there. I can't sing. I can't. But forget what you can't do and focus on what you can do. Hallelujah. And get with it. No one, you know, I don't know of anybody that sanctions Samson's behavior as far as the prostitutes, etc. But you can't question the fact of what he accomplished. He was the start, the deliverance from the Philistines for the Israelites. That is fulfilled years later when David is king and he accomplishes it. Saul was killed by the Philistines, King Saul. What I want you to understand is maybe what you're doing is just the beginning of something. Don't sweat over it. I was praying in this room yesterday and I said, God, I want you to make Lighthouse's hair grow. And I'm serious. Yeah. I don't believe this 